this is John Cole with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. And in this episode, I'm going to go ahead and answer your guys' questions. I do this about, I try to do this about once a month. Uh, answer your guys' questions in a video such as this on my OK Raw channel. I also do this on my gardening channel, Growing Your Greens. And I apologize in advance. You know, I get a lot of different DMs through Facebook, Instagram, and different methods. And I have a policy where I just won't respond to anybody. I have, you know, close to a million followers now and it's kind of insane and I just can't get back to everybody so I just can't reply to anybody because I'm just having a problem keeping up with my life, growing my food, running my business, making my food, preparing my food and rest and relaxation um, to recover <laughs> and then making more videos, editing more videos and uploading more videos. I'm a team of one so I do all my own stuff. I don't have any help. I don't have any person help me, I don't have any employees, you know, all this kind of stuff. I just make it happen, Captain, all right? So I apologize in advance. Now, if you do have a question for me, I do have a few ways you can contact me. Number one is I'll post a link down below uh, to the community tab on my OK Raw channel. You can ask your questions there, and I will pull from the questions that are asked on my community tab for a video like this for next month. Okay, the second way you guys could do it is you can contact me directly for a 10 minute coaching session for just $5 plus a small service fee from Fiverr.com. Link is down below. It'll say garden coaching, but I'm glad to talk to you about anything that I'm able, although I don't know everything. And I'll be upfront about that. I know a lot of things, but I don't know everything, all right? So in this episode, we'll be answering your questions. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, first question is from Elizabeth Scott. How much, if any, focus do you place on keeping your body alkalized through your diet? <laughs> so honestly, I mean, I might have checked my alkaline pH levels, you know, with some little test strips a while back. I don't recall when I did that last. It's not a major importance to me. You know, I think getting all anal about being alkaline or acid and all these things is just kind of like maybe your time would be well spent focusing on other areas of your life. That being said, I will say that alkaline forming foods are generally healthy foods. So plants are generally alkaline forming. There's like some exceptions depending on the plant food you're eating. And you know, animal products and dairy are acid forming. So I would definitely agree that you want to minimize or completely eliminate the animal foods altogether and maximize your amount of plant foods. And of course, of the plant foods, what foods are the most alkalizing of the plant foods? They're the leafy green vegetables and the vegetables in general. Yes, fruits could also be alkalizing too. You're not going to diss on fruits. But, you know, my goal is to focus around a, a vegetable-based diet. I mean, yeah, some people have a fruit-based diet. That's great. My goal is to have a vegetable-based diet where I'm eating copious amounts of vegetables and other smaller amounts of other things, including fruits, nuts, seeds, and grains, uh, mushrooms, and whatnot, okay? So, you know, every day... I drink about 70 ounces of juice, approximately, maybe 68, I don't know, something like that. Um, and that's basically about 8 to 9 pounds of vegetables, with maybe a little bit of fruit added for sweetness. Put a little bit of pineapple or apple in there, but I do a gr straight up green juice with no sweeteners in there. That's usually, um, you know, romaine lettuce, cucumber, celery, and greens out of my garden, whether it's kale. Right now it's water spinach a lot. Um, could be some spinach uh, also in that green drink or other leafy greens that I'm able to source locally, organic, of course. Then I do a root juice, which is basically mostly carrot-based. I try to get as many purple carrots as in there as I, I can as possible, as well as beets predominantly. That's the main recipe, plus some ginger, plus some turmeric, uh, plus other roots, whether it's like uh, horseradish, last week I put in gobo root or burdock root, I put in turnips, Oh, radishes in there and so it's basically a root juice with maybe a few apples and or pineapple added in for sweetness and then I'll do my turmeric ginger and last week I started adding ginseng with rosemary shots in there and that's before I even eat anything else and by that time it's like I'm so full on juice hydrated from the juice and now those juices are totally alkaline forming but I'm not focusing on an alkaline based diet right <laughs> I'm focused on eating fruits and vegetables and by default, you should be eating an alkaline diet. You know, so I think by drinking alkaline water and all this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, one of the things I think is that alkaline water, I mean, here's the thing. 
the, the alkaline diet is based around the minerals you're consuming and the ash that they're producing, right? Certain foods contain certain minerals and proteins that then turn into acids, some turn into alkaline in our bodies, and if we remove certain minerals out of the water and can concentrate certain ones and hydro, hydro, use hydrolysis and all these things, you know, they say alkaline water is good to alkalinize yourself, and I would put forth that It'd be far better for you guys, instead of drinking alkaline water out of your alkaline water machine, I know they cost a lot of money, especially if you got a Kangen, it'd be far better to just buy some leafy greens and juice them, you know, like romaine leaf juice, and just drink that straight, which actually I love romaine lettuce juice straight, um, romaine heart lettuce juice, organic. That's a lot more alkalizing, plus aside from just being alkalizing, you're getting all a host of other benefits. It's also low D or deuterium. If you want to look into that further, that's kind of incredible on that point. And it's also full of vitamins, minerals, and more importantly, the minerals in the, that have the right charge and polarity so that you can absorb them properly. So it's very important to me is to not just, you know, focus on this one thing, but focus on the whole bigger picture. And that's why I say eat plants for the win and focus your diet around vegetables. All right, next question is from Truth in Entertainment. Have you heard of Dr. Axe and or Dr. Mercola? If so, what are your opinions on them? Yes, yeah, so I have heard of Dr. Axe. I visit his website when I'm doing different searches and I've seen a few YouTube videos from him, but I don't follow him on any regular basis. I've met Dr. Mercola in person at different health food trade shows. And, you know, seen his massive web store where he sells all kinds of gadgets and gizmos and promotes products. And what I'll say about those two guys are this. Number one, I'm glad they're doing what they're doing to expose more people to eating a natural, you know, nutrient-dense diet. Okay, that's number one. I'm glad they reach out and do many interviews and do a lot of teaching about things that I would agree with. That being said, <laughs> I also would say that I don't agree with them on many positions that they take. You know, I, I think they're mostly into a more keto, meat-based uh, diet these days, which I am definitely not a fan of. You know, if you want to include some meats in your healthy diet, you know, I'm not going to be the radical vegan says, you can't eat any meat, you got to go vegan. You know, hey, if you want to go all vegan, all plant-based, that's great. That's what I choose to do, but I'm not going to tell you guys what to do. Um, at the same time, I think that most people that advocate meat diet, meat, meat, meat in the diet advocate far too much meat in the diet. And optimally for health, based on the research that I've seen, you should eat no more than 10% maximum of calories of meat or animal products. Even better yet, get it down to 5 and the other 95% should be plant-based. You know, we're actually just eating real plants, not even plant-based because you eat like, you know, spaghetti <laughs> made from durum wheat and that's plant-based, but it's not healthy. So we really want to focus our diets around fruits and vegetables, which is my main message. And of course, they do advocate fruits and vegetables. You know, I will say that both of them have been really marketing machines and they're a little bit hyped up in my opinion. And I think that's a good thing to get the information out there. I know Mercola has a lot of different products he sells, and at the trade show I visited his Dr. Mercola booth, and one of the guys at his booth was really an asshole. I'm sorry, I don't know who that was, but some dude at that his booth was just really a smart ass, like sarcastic, and just almost condescending to me. And like, I did not appreciate that. So I'll be, I'm glad to say that, you know, because I tell the truth, and that was my experience at the Dr. Mercola booth. I also think that Dr. Mercola you know, it is cool because he promotes vacuum blending, which he has his own vacuum blender, which I heard actually doesn't perform that well. It's probably a little overpriced for what it is. He also promotes juicing, which I'm big fans of as well. So, you know, I can't really comment otherwise because I don't follow their work specifically, but I do know they promote some good stuff, but they also promote some things that I would not be in line with. So what, what I will say in the end is, in, is this, is I want you guys to follow a multitude of sources. No one person, including me, has all the answers. You might get this little tidbit from Miss Joe Marcola. You might get this from Josh Axe. You might get this tidbit from me and compile it all together into, into what you choose to do. What I choose to do is basically what I choose to do. And I, I share that with you guys in case you guys want to model or follow me, you know, try things that I do to see if it helps and works for you. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I think I'm pretty solid on back with a lot of scientific study, trying things and feeling a difference in many products and some of the things I recommend, you know, there, there's definitely science that shows that it, it works, right? And that's pretty much it. All right, next question is from Raw Intuition. John, I'm planning to move in the next couple years 
to begin growing a tropical fruit orchard. I would prefer somewhere I can still grow stone fruits and plenty of veggies as well. Where would you suggest I go? All right, so the question there is, what's more important to you? Stone fruits or tropical fruits? <laughs> because as you, got, as you may be aware, stone fruits are generally temperate climate fruits. They're not tropical fruits. And the reason for that is they require some amount of chill hours. Now, some stone fruits could require low chill hours than higher chill hours. But basically, that means they need to have a winter season where it's cold a, a good period of time or the trees will not produce. And of course, in the tropics, a lot of the tropical trees, they don't want any chill hours because they don't like being chilly and they can't handle chill hours and they might not make it. They'll croak and they're not going to do good. You know, so... That's the conundrum you're going to have. Now, yes, you can get some tropical trees that are more, you know, resistant to some cold weather to some extent, but not to the super extent. And then you could find some stone fruits that maybe need less chill hours than others, so you'll still be able to grow some stone fruits. So I think the goal for you is to find, you know, the low chill hour stone fruits and then find an area that has that amount of low chill hours so you could get away with growing some of the stone fruits you want, right? There's no perfect climate in the whole world. You know, that's why when I do move to the tropics, I still will have a temperate climate location to, to go back to in the summer so I can enjoy the fruits there and all this kind of stuff. You know, so there are places in the world where you could actually grow tropical and temperate climate fruits at the same time. <laughs> and one of those places is actually on... Maui or a few of the Hawaiian islands they have high tall peaks so I know on on Maui there's some peach growers that grow up on the mountain literally where they get chill hours because literally in Hawaii believe it or not you could go skiing in the winter and then go down to the beach also in the winter and have an, an amazing 80 degree day because the altitude is so high you get the chill hours now that being said you're gonna have to have two properties on that island because you have to have a <laughs> a tropical climate property where you get no chill hours and then a temperate climate property higher up in elevation where you have the chill hours. So I don't know any, I mean, I'm sure there's other places in the world that are like this as well, but Maui struck, stuck out because I was like, wow, there's peach farmers here? That's quite odd. So, um, so that's what I'd say. I mean, otherwise, you know, a lot of places in the continental United States like Florida, you know, depending on where in Florida you live, you may get more chill hours and less. And that'll, if you have more chill hours, that's going to restrict some of the tropical fruits you could grow. And so that, that's a whole big conundrum there. I mean, maybe South Texas, Brownsville, San Padre Island might be a little more tropical. You might get a few chill hours. And you're just going to have to find climatized appropriate fruits for that. Of course, in something like San Diego, in that area down there, or maybe Phoenix, um, well, you could get some chill hours maybe a little bit chill hours in Phoenix, maybe low chill hour fruits, you know, and it, but it's also really hot. So maybe San Diego might be pretty good, but it also depends on what you want to grow. So you got to come out with a list of what you want to grow specifically and then match that up with the location you're going to buy. So, uh, you know, of course, Puerto Rico, that's mostly tropical. So that's going to be out of the question. Um, so yeah, pick your battles and choose what fruits you want to grow more or maybe just travel sometimes of the year. Okay. All right. The next question is from Celine. Uh, hi John, do you think there could be a good possibility of a permaculture fruit garden being able to survive in a southwest Arizona climate if there are efforts made to provide the garden enough water and transform the sand using wood chips, fertilizer, garden soil, compost, etc.? Owning land in AZ is affordable compared to many other states or do you think battling the heat wouldn't be worth the effort? My vision is a large self and family sustaining fruit and vegetable garden. All right, Celine. So basically, every different climate will provide you with different conditions that is more optimized for growing different trees and veggie plants. Now, Arizona, you know, I'm quite familiar growing in the Southwest because I grow a garden in the Southwest myself. And there are absolutely trees you guys could grow there that will do amazing. Pomegranates come to the top of my head, jujube come to the top of my head. You know, date palms, top of my head. You know, those are some of the ones that are going to really thrive in the desert kind environment. You know, other fruit trees like some persimmons might do pretty good. You know, some apples, you know, that have low chill hours, apples. Some fruits 
um, you know, like uh, nectarines and peaches and of course apricots do really well because they produce pretty much before the heat of the summer comes on. And there are other crops. I mean, if you're in Phoenix area in Arizona, you know, you have a lot more flexibility. You could do a lot more tropical fruits down there. Um, maybe not so much of the temperate climate stuff, but you may need to protect some of your stuff. And of course, regreening the desert is a possibility wherever you live. That being said, you might have to work a lot harder at it. The soils are not that good. And, you know, I would definitely encourage you to find a, basically in, around Phoenix area, they have basically flood irrigated properties where basically the water is really inexpensive. And that would probably be your best bet so you actually have a source of water. Because um, just trying to use all the water for your trees, especially if you're having to pay for it, like on your water bill and you don't have a well, could get quite expensive. So you could do anything you want anywhere. Um, and I don't know. Phoenix or Arizona would not be my first choice for making some kind of food forest because you just have the cards stacked against you, not to say you can't do it. And also in the summertime in 100 plus degree weather, you know, you can grow some vegetables, but you're really going to be limited on growing vegetables, you know, on the ones that you could grow that are actually going to grow well for you. You know, and I've learned that by living in the Southwest where it is over 100 degrees daily and most Food forests I see in, in Arizona <laughs> don't have a lot of vegetables. They have mostly fruit trees because they're a lot easier to take care of. So I think that's where it's really going to fall short. So you might want to look towards, well, California's a bit more expensive. Maybe like Brownsville, Texas, if it's going to get wiped out by the last hurricane, San Padre Island, or South Florida. I mean, the Miami side, kind of really expensive. Homestead could be rather a little bit less expensive. And or the Tampa Bay side could also be less expensive and that'll also that'll provide you a better climate to do food food for us and there's a lot better resources in my opinion in the you know South Florida area including Echo um, in Fort Myers and another place Heart Village I think they're in like Lakeland area of Florida all right next question is from Luke Swales hey John what do you shave with <laughs> so I used to use like a, a manual razor that had like three blades and I used like basically probiotic soap and jojoba oil as my shaving cream. That being said, you know, that just kind of gets old nicking yourself and while that would provide a pretty clean, smooth shave, it's just, you know, keep having to buy blades and all this kind of stuff. So I went to a Panasonic um, cordless rechargeable electric shaver and I've never been happier. I own two, one travels with me when I travel and one stays at home and that gets almost as close as shaving with like a razor but I find it a lot more effective and I don't have to you know wet down my face and all this stuff it's just a lot easier so that's what I use so uh, next question is from Alex hi John frequently we see reports of the negative impacts of high fluoride levels on the body what's your opinion on fluoride also is it safe to drink black tea which is very high in fluoride thank you all right Alex so number one I agree that high fluoride levels in the body is not a good thing. I am staunchly opposed to drugging the water and adding fluoride to the water and saying it's good for our teeth when really it's probably just toxic chemicals that they're just trying to get rid of and put it in the water. And even if fluoride, fluorinated water is good for our teeth, why are they putting it in the water and they're telling us to swallow the water so now that we get it in other areas and other parts of our bodies besides just our teeth. If it was good for our teeth, yeah, I mean, maybe you could swish it around in your mouth and spit it out, but people just drink fluorinated water. I think it's causing big issues, personally. Um, you know, fluoride is not an essential nutrient. I do not go out of my way to, you know, drink fluorinated water. Um, I actually, in where I live, they fluorinate the water, so I use three different kind of systems. I use a whole house filter, then it goes through a reverse osmosis filter, that has basically five different filters in line and then I take that water and then I put it through a distiller and then do a carbon filter after this distillation. And that's what I do to get water when I want to drink water. That being said, my goal is to get water from the produce that I juice. And so I don't drink a lot of water. All right. And then uh, what's your opinion on fluoride? Yeah, so fluoride, I don't think, it's not a necessary nutrient and do not go out of your way to consume it. I, I do not personally believe, and I'm not a medical doctor and consult your medical doctor or dentist, I personally don't believe it's the best thing for our teeth to remineralize it. There are far better materials out. You know, I use a toothpaste from Japan called Apgard, A-P-A-G-U-G-A-R-D, I believe. 
and that is a better mineralization with no fluoride um, based on scientific proven studies um, that I use instead of using fluoride, okay? Is it safe to drink black tea which is very high in fluoride? So, you know, any plant food can concentrate, you know, toxins, whether it's, uh, you know, heavy metals, fluoride, or otherwise. And is it safe to drink black tea? I will leave that up for you to decide. I mean, I guess the question is, the dose is always in the poison. So, for example, today I harvested four gallons of my kombucha tea that I make. Actually, I put it in like literally a month and two weeks ago. So it's been brewing for a month and two weeks. That's the first fermentation. I then poured it all out, reset it, put back more tea in there, and actually I, blew, I brewed black tea. Now I did brew like maybe two bags of black tea, two bags of white tea, and one bag of green tea, you know, per, uh, per, per gallon or whatever um, that I made. Um, so I'm getting a mix of different teas, and the other thing is I don't drink tea like every day. I might have a little bit of kombucha, and my kombucha is not like the sugared down garbage at the grocery store that you guys could buy. That's basically just like, uh, you know, maybe a healthier soda. Mine's like really medicinal. Mine tastes like more like vinegar, and it just, it's doused with ginger, turmeric, and just, it's hardcore, man. It Like most of you guys, if you guys are used to drinking regular kombucha, you're like, this tastes nasty, John. And I might say that... <laughs> my kombucha is not the best tasting in terms of like sweet, but it's definitely medicinal. And then I do a secondary ferment, and this secondary ferment got basically pineapple juice mixed with jicama juice, mixed with uh, pine with uh, ginger, turmeric, and some ginseng in there. Oh, and rosemary in there also. So yeah, so you know, I think that uh, tea in moderation is perfectly fine, uh, and moderation is what that means to you. I personally would rather drink juices. Um, I don't drink a lot of teas. If I was going to use a tea product, I would use matcha tea. So one of the things I want to do is I want to spike my kombucha teas with the matcha tea powder because it's going to have a lot more benefits from having basically ground up tea leaves where you're getting all the nutrition from the tea versus putting tea leaves in water and then letting some of the nutrients soak out into the water. So you're getting a very limited amount of nutrients by drinking tea. Not to say that it's bad, but you know, tea is a lot better than coffee or soda, but I would rather drink a juice, all right? So that's my answer. Uh, let's see, HJ Carpentier. Did the nitric oxide tablets work? I can't find that video of your interview with Nathan Bryan, so, one, so wondering, thanks for the wealth of info, it's changing my life. All right, so, I, the video is still up on Dr. Nathan Bryan and the nitric oxide. It's probably about three videos ago from this video. And it's about the one uh, nutrient that can sabotage your health or something like that. And yes, I believe, for me personally, the nitric oxide tablets work. I was testing my blood pressure, you know, before and after taking the nitric oxide tablets. And I saw a reduction in my blood pressure. And uh, that's all I'll say about that. Otherwise, I don't really feel much from taking them. Um, they're a bit expensive. I will say that. <laughs> okay. But I think overall, they're a good thing for me personally, and I don't, I don't know about for you. Okay. Uh, next question is from Paul Mignon. What's your favorite vegetable that's diverse and stores long? All right, Paul, that is an easy one. Purple carrots. I love purple carrots. It's diverse, and even if you don't want to do purple carrots, you could do red carrots, or green carrots, or orange carrots, or yellow carrots, or white carrots, right? Uh, carrots are an amazing food. Before the pandemic, I went to California, brought all these black or purple, deep purple carrots, put them in my fridge, and I was able to basically keep them for like two months because I hadn't gone to California to buy more purple carrots like I normally would because I'm not traveling at present time, and they stored easily for two months. I had a few go bad. But for the most part, you know, kept in a cold refrigerator that I keep anywhere between 33 and 36 degrees. No problem storing them in a sealed, don't keep them open, sealed plastic bag with a few holes to get, get a little, little bit of air breathing in there, but not too many because you don't want to let all the moisture out, okay? But yeah, and the purple carrots are really nutrient dense. They're anthocyanin rich and they're storing long. So whether you want to grow them yourself and harvest them all and then store them, or better yet, you know, if you live somewhere where it snows, you can keep the carrots in the ground over the winter and before the snow comes or the, the cold weather comes,
basically keep them in the ground, grow them so that they're a nice size by the time, you know, you get your first freeze. Before the first freeze, pile them high with like just, you know, leaves or wood chips or whatever and just bury them with wood chips. And they'll, they basically, the wood chips or the leaves will insulate the ground so you can keep your carrots underneath the ground growing. Actually, they won't really grow during the winter, but they're going to stay alive like they were in your fridge, which is actually better than keeping them in the fridge personally, if you could do that. And then uh, go out and dig them up as you need them, okay? Next question is from Jonas Atio. Thoughts on organic lettuce versus pesticide-free non-organic? So that's a good question. So, you know, it, that's, a, that's a kind of a difficult question on some levels. So, you know, like, what, what is the organic lettuce and what is the pesticide-free non-organic, right? What, it, what I would be concerned about, because pesticides is one of the things that I'm concerned about, of course, and I want to minimize uh, the exposure and even not include any pesticides, um, you know, especially chemical pesticides, in my diet as much as possible. The other question is, what are the growing practices the farmer is using so that you guys could make the best choice and you could choose the most nutritious food, okay? So I could give you some examples. So... Maybe they grow pesticide-free, non-organic, because it's not certified, but they use things like rock dust. They are a, a, aware of this food soil web, and they put on compost tea on their garden. You know, I'd much rather have that pesticide-free lettuce grown in rock dust and using, you know, compost tea and grown with the food soil web um, techniques versus an organic lettuce using just cow manure that's likely from a factory farm as the organic fertilizer they're using, right? So it all, it just kind of depends, you know, I'm more concerned about the farming practices. And now, of course, I don't want any kind of lettuce that has pesticides on it, but also I want to maximize nutrition. I guess another question I would ask is, were they both harvested at the same time? You know, so is the organic lettuce harvested a week ago and the pesticide-free non-organic, you know, harvested, you know, two days ago, right? Well, I want the stuff that's harvested two days ago, right? I don't want the stuff harvested a week or two ago, right? I guess another question would be, what color is the lettuce? Okay, is the organic lettuce just some like bib lettuce that's like really light for its size and green and really maybe nice green, but really light? And is the pesticide free non-organic lettuce like a nice Lola Rosa lettuce that's like that rich lipstick red color, you know, that's a lot bigger. So like number one, I go by like size kind of matters to me. If I'm spending $2 for a head of lettuce, I want the largest size I could get. But also more importantly is what color is it? You know, red lettuces are at least two times or three times or four times way more nutritious than the green lettuces due to the pigments, including anthocyanin pigments that are in there. So, you know, that would be more of a determining factor for me if it's red or not when it was, when it was harvested and also the growing practices because that's also very important to me. I mean, they have organic lettuce now that's hydroponic grown, you know, so would I have hydroponic grown organic lettuce or would I have pesticide free non-organic lettuce grown in the soil? I'd have non-organic uh, pesticide free grown in the soil. So there's a lot of different categories. So you need to figure out. And also the other thing is taste test it. Which one tastes better to you, right? In general, if it tastes better to you, it's probably more nutritious. That's not always tried and true, but that's a good sense. You know, hey, if you, if you like it more because you can eat more of it because it tastes better, buy that one. You know, so there's a few criteria that I would use to figure that one out, all right? So next question is from Annabelle Dufel. What does RAW stand for? All right, so I don't, I don't know the meaning of that. What does RAW stand for? I mean, OK RAW stands for it's OK to eat raw foods <laughs> or be a raw vegan, right? Um, in general, you know, there's no legal definition of what raw foods, and I'm using raw in the terms of foods. Basically, raw means minimally processed or not processed. To me personally, although if you go to the grocery store and you buy raw almonds, they've been steam pasteurized or even, you know, uh, chemically pasteurized, which I, I wouldn't consider that raw. Raw cashews at the bulk bins, you know, they are also heat processed, so they're no longer raw. Generally, raw does me does me means that it's not been cooked and or heated above 118 degrees, but there is no legal definition for that, all right? So I would encourage you to watch a video entitled, Just Because It's Raw Doesn't Mean It's Healthy. Remember, I'll put a link down below to that video where I discuss more about being raw and being healthy because just because it's raw doesn't mean it's healthy. There's a whole bunch of criteria that you should figure out 
um, you know, your, for yourself to determine if something is healthy for you or not, okay? Let's see, next question is from uh, La Mumba Arika Hera. What is your fermented bean recipe? All right, so here's my fermented bean recipe. I'm going to make a video on this one of these days, but I want to make sure I get a good batch. And I got my system dialed in before I share it because I'm still kind of experimenting, honestly. Okay, so basically I, I get two pounds of organic turtle black beans, and I get those at Natural Grocers. I cook those up in the Instapot. Um, those get cooked in my Instapot with a good sufficient amount of water, like, covering them. I think it's like maybe, I forget, eight cups of water, like a lot of water with two pounds of beans. I cook it for like 55 minutes to get them nice and soft. I then drain off the water, pour off the water into my garden, and then I use, I basically take half the beans, so about a pound's worth, or half the beans, whatever, they expand a little bit when they cook. I take half the beans and I add it to like six ounces of apple juice and fresh made, and then about six ounces of uh, my kimchi or sauerkraut that I made, homemade fresh. And then also, for good, good results, I also put in some uh, Dr. O'Hara's probiotic, um, uh, probiotic capsule. So they have special strains of probiotics in there that are shown to grow on the beans as they ferment. I forget the exact varieties right now off the top of my head. I blend that up with a blender and then I basically put it in a um, 64 ounce or half gallon mason jar with a vacuum lid on the top that's available at Amazon. Look up vacuum fermentation lids. And then I just basically make sure the air is sucked out so that no mold grows on the top. And I just leave that there for like a week or two on my countertop and it will start to bubble and ferment and it'll get really zingy for you, kind of like a sauerkraut would. The last batch I made is, is pretty doggone zingy and I probably let it go a little bit too far, but that's all right, you know, when it's so zingy, I don't eat as much of it, but that's all right for me. You know, beans for some vegans might be a, a main dish. For me, it's actually a condiment, so I like to include some beans with my salad or beans with my wraps or beans with my soups or whatever I'm mixing into. It also is a really easy dressing when I'm really lazy. I could cut up vegetables and greens and have this fermented bean sauce basically with, with some sauerkraut in there. And then I pour that over as my dressing and then boom, I'm eating. Super simple, super easy, all right? So that's the process. Uh, let's see, next question is from Explore the Earth. I've been watching you a long time. I have a question. I found out that diabetes is caused by pancreatitis or damaged pancreas. How can we reverse this? God bless. All right, so if you have a medical condition, please consult a doctor. I'm not a doctor. What I will tell you is this. There are many types of diabetes. There's like type 1, type 1.5, type 2, and even I heard there's a type 3 out there, which I just heard about today. Um, there's many types. Some of them are because your body's not making insulin, and that may be when it gets damaged for some reason. Maybe because of the pancreas damage or not. I'm not really sure because that's not my specific area of interest. But what I will say is this. You know, some types of diabetes, like type 2 diabetes, can be easily reversed. I have friends that have done it. I know people that have done it. Um, and I would recommend a friend of mine, Robbie Barbero, and I'll put a link down below to the video I made with Robbie about diabetes and how you can reverse it by cleaning up your diet and not eating the foods that probably gave you the diabetes in the first place or throws your blood sugar out of control, which includes high fat foods and processed foods, right? So you guys want to check out, if you want to learn more about diabetes, masteringdiabetes.org or check the link down below for my video with Robbie where we go into this more in detail and please contact Robbie and his crew there at Mastering Diabetes including Cyrus. I mean, those are the guys that you really want to ask any diabetes questions to because they, they live with type 1 diabetes, actually. And that being said, you know, some diabetes like type 1, maybe I've heard it in some extreme cases being reversed if you catch it early enough, but if, if you've got it as a child and you've been living it for, for all these years, you know, I think there's a smaller probability that you can potentially reverse that. I think anything is always possible, especially through prayer, thought, you know, changing the right diet, reducing your stress, and allowing your body to heal. Um, that being said, you know, Robbie is a type 1 himself, and he has drastically reduced his insulin need by eating a proper diet, okay? Next question is from Andy Rose. I have a question. I'm going on a vegetable and fruit vegan diet. Do I need sodium? If so, where do I get it? Uh, please, thanks. All right. Andy, so... Sodium is an essential nutrient. 
That's what I'm going to say. Sodium is an essential nutrient. We can get it through a whole food plant-based diet if done appropriately and you're paying at least a little bit of attention, right? I had a friend who's a raw foodist for a long time and he maybe was eating a lot of fruits and not really eating a lot of vegetables. And I don't exactly know what he ate because I don't, I don't know what he ate, but he was sodium deficient. So it is possible to be sodium deficient on a whole food plant-based diet if you're not paying attention. So for example, if you want to ensure you get your sodium, drink a celery juice every day or you know, if you juice a head of celery every day, I'm pretty confident, <laughs> unless you have a malabsorption issue, you're going to have enough sodium in your body every day. I know some people may recommend, oh, eat sea salt for your sodium, and I highly discourage against that. To me, salt is not a health food. Put a link down below to a video that I made on this very topic on why salt is not a health food. Number one, salt is not a food at all. It's a mineral, and while sodium is essential in our diets, you know, the small percentage of trace minerals that come along with the salt so that people justify their salt consumption is ridiculous. I mean, it's like 90% sodium, maybe some of the better ones are 96% sodium, and 4% or 1% of other trace minerals. There are far better ways to get other trace minerals in your body if you guys want to. In my last episode, I talked about eating seaweeds. Seaweeds have sodium in it. They also have iodine in it. They also or iodine, if you want to call it that. They also have other different trace minerals that are very important for us. So I choose to eat you know, sea vegetables instead of salt. And of course, in the previous episode, I also talked about some other sodium sources that are good, but we can get sodium from just the foods we eat. If you eat a proper, properly planned diet, you know, eat good amounts of leafy greens, juice some celery, and you're probably gonna be golden, all right? It's rare that people are sodium deficient. The problem in America today is that people eat way too much sodium. My goal is to keep my sodium intake in milligrams under 1500 milligrams, I would like to keep it actually more like around a thousand and I've noticed I feel better when I do lower sodium I feel more sluggish if I eat higher sodium. I do not generally add salt to my meals Although I do eat some ingredients that have small amounts of salt But my goal is to minimize and eliminate and not eat any additional salt Some people may think that extreme, but I think that actually that is a lot healthier and people have these addictions to salt and they just don't want to give it up and you know, everybody could do what they want. <laughs> but these are my opinions, all right? And what I choose to do. Next question is from Korg Rosewood Timbers. Sorry, John, for the wrong question. Do you still use your D-Link pendant and Smart Dot sticker? So actually, it's a Q-Link pendant. And yes, if you guys see it, it's sitting here somewhere. This is my Q-Link pendant. I still wear this. I lost it for a little bit. The TSA lost it at the Las Vegas airport and they never found it for me and I was quite, I wasn't quite upset because I just bought another one on eBay. And then I have the Smart Dot on the back. So I'm not totally convinced the Smart Dot does everything and the sticker's kind of wearing off now a little bit. But you know, hey, if it makes, I put my mind at ease, it's probably a good thing and the lady says it worked and I, I, I tend to trust her, she seemed like a legit person. Um, but the Q-Link I would definitely recommend for everybody. I definitely feel more centered, more balanced and just more more on point with it on than with it out with it off and you know for some people that they may think it's hocus pocus but here's the thing even if this is a 100% placebo effect it's still affecting me in a positive light and it is a one-time purchase that does not run out in addition when I bought this well a different one the original one originally I did Carillion photography with my fingertips and the Carillion photography when I did my before fingertip Carillion photography was better than somebody that just wore it for a day and then did their after. So I'm like, this thing is not going to work. I mean, so I already thought, like, in my head, this cueing is not going to work for me. Then I went back the second day, did my acrylic photography on my fingertips, and it showed that I was even radiating more energy, had a stronger energy field. So I'm like, oh, something's going on here. So I bought one, and I've pretty much been wearing it ever since. And I only take it off the shower, otherwise it's always around my neck. Next question is from uh, Star Walker. Yes, John, I heard that eating apple seeds is toxic. Can you touch on this? So there are many things that are toxic to us. And yes, apple seeds do contain a form of cyanide as far as I'm aware. And, you eat, and if you eat enough of them, actually, it, they're, 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 they're poisonous. So yes, I totally agree with that. Now, the situation arises, like I talked about a little bit earlier, is that the dose is in the poison. 
I calculated it one day and I don't remember I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but you'd have to eat like the seeds out of 200 apples or some crazy amount of apples to get enough toxicity from apple seeds to have some potential poison problems, right? So I juice apples with the seeds all the time and I'm not really concerned about it because I'm eating it in low amounts, you know? And here some things, some comments that I want to give are this. Okay, now number one, you know, bitter apricot kernels probably have more cyanide than the apple seeds. They're also a lot larger and yet they sell bitter apricot kernels in the store and they say they contain laetrile, which is basically an anti-cancer because of the toxic cyanide or the laetrile in there, which is also known as B17. And so they say by eating a few of them and don't overdose on those either because they're quite toxic in high amounts, um, you know, that can be actually cancer preventative. So, you know, my personal opinion is that a few apple seeds, you know, every, every now and then, not a big issue. But if you eat a lot of them, that is a big issue. Now, of course, some people are different. They can't absorb things or they absorb things more. So I leave that up to your choices. But for me, you know, I'll juice, you know, five apples in a day and drink the juice. Well, I spread the juice out because I don't drink all straight apple juice generally. Although I do put apple juice with the, with the juice seeds into my fermented beans and into my sauerkrauts and kimchi as a sweetener to help the probiotics grow even more, more efficiently. Now the final point I'd like to make is that here's a reason why you want to probably try to eat the whole apple instead of just, you know, eat the apple and throw away the core, right? There's been proven science that comes out that the probably the biggest microbiome element of the apple is actually in the core, near the stem, into the main seed area, and in the bottom. There's more microbiome or beneficial probiotics in that area of the apple than everything else in the apple. Okay, so that might be a good reason to do that if the apple is not super old and going moldy inside the middle of the core and the stem, in which case I do not recommend you guys eat it, okay? <laughs> now the other thing I will say is that on apples actually, the apple skins are probably the most nutrient dense part of the apple as well. And you know, so don't peel the skin and throw it away, make sure you eat the skin and actually lay, actually just the other night I was like researching, I want to just buy an apple peel extract powder. Because, you know, there's a lot of research on apple peels themselves and how beneficial they are. And when you do eat the skin, try to chew it up and masticate it in little bits. Because otherwise, if you just chew up big fragments and swallow big fragments, you're not going to get the nutrients out. So that's why generally, you know, I juice apples with a good juicer that grinds up all the skins and gets some of those nutrients out of the skins and into my juice. And the other thing that I'll mention is that it would be far more efficient to buy crab apples or those little small apples. Why? Because they have a lot more skin area than fruit area, and crab apples generally are not as sweet. Or if you could find some wild apples near you, that would be even better. Okay, la uh, next question is from Lord Spawn. I would like to start juicing, but I don't really know where to start. I would like to plan what I'm going to juice for the week so I can get a shopping list. I'm not really sure what I should be combining to get a well-rounded juice cocktail as far as vitamins and nutrients. Every Anyone have something like like a spreadsheet I can follow to get the hang of things. All right, so, I mean, some people may think I'm methodical in my ways, but when I'm juicing, I'm really not super methodical. Well, I guess I am methodical in my own ways, but I don't really plan out like what I'm gonna juice. I kind of have a basis of what I juice, and I'm not gonna say what I juice is right and you guys should follow exactly what I do, but what I will tell you is this, right? What I juice is based around the organic produce that I could buy locally, available, in large quantities and get for pretty inexpensive. So I could like get organic heads of celery for a buck fifty. Actually a couple weeks ago it was a dollar twenty eight for a head of celery. So I just buy a bunch of celery and then I'll go, I'll find organic well actually this last week I got non-organic hothouse grown English cucumbers for fifty cents each. So I'll buy a you know sixteen of those and then I'm juicing those and I'll buy like you know Six heads of romaine hearts at Costco for $4.99. They were $3.99. They upped the price, those, those suckers. And then I'll basically make a green juice out of that. And then I'll harvest things from my backyard of greens that I have. I also make a root juice that's based around carrots mostly with other roots, right? So here's the thing to sum up, you know, what do you juice for the most nutrition is juice a variety. The biggest mistake you can make on juicing, and I do have videos on mistakes you can make on juicing, 
is juicing the same lemon ginger blast every single day of your life. Why? Because it's great you're getting a lot of ginger and celery and the different you know ingredients that are in the turmeric ginger blast, lemon blast, but it's bad because you're missing all the other nutrients in all the other fruits and vegetables. You know, so basically the general guidelines is this. I want you guys to juice roots because roots absorb different nutrients than the leaves of the plants and the stems of the plants. So I want you guys to juice roots, stems, and celery is a stem vegetable. I mean, I juice other vegetables out of my garden that I just harvest the whole stems like water spinach. I want you guys to do roots, stems, and leaves. And then also flowers of vegetables, so that would be like cauliflower or broccoli, right? And, you know, get a plethora of them and always juice different ones. And luckily, because I'm pretty frugal <laughs> when I go shopping, like this week broccoli is on sale, the next week celery is on sale, this week this is on sale, the next week this is on sale. And guess what I'm buying that week? The thing on sale, and that's what I'm juicing that week. So that way I'm always changing my what I'm juicing and with some commonalities in there, of course, because I always have a recipe base. The base of my carrot juice is juice generally carrots with beets and other root vegetables that I mentioned earlier. And the, the base of my green juice is usually either cucumber or celery or maybe romaine lettuce or I'll do straight romaine lettuce sometimes depending on the availability and what I have and what I feel like juicing and also greens in my garden. I don't tend to juice a lot of fruits and I do not encourage you guys to juice a lot of fruits. I encourage you guys to eat your fruits whole in general. Um, and also uh, make them into vacuum blended smoothies if you want to get more fruits in your diet. But I recommend you know eating different parts of plants, you know, and also eating different ones because then you'll get a more well-rounded plan. So, I mean, I have a recipe book. You guys can check out my recipe book. By by no means, I would definitely there's a, maybe a handful of recipes of juice juice recipes in there. It's gyg book. Dot com if you're interested in my um, recipe book that's 100% raw food recipes in there with juices, smoothies, as well as other healthy meals. Uh, let's see here. So uh, next, last question is from Sorry Supporter since 2017. And the question is, why don't you ever get to the point right away? <laughs> that's a good question. So why don't I get to the point right away? I'll tell you a story. So. The story is, as a child, right, I would grow up my dad and I'd ask him a question and he always give me a long answer. And it always gets so frustrated, like, Dad, I just want to know the answer. I don't want to know this whole long story. But here's the thing, much like a Leave it to Beaver episode, if you ever watched that show or in the olden days, right, you can't just give the moral of the story and expect somebody to pick up on it and enact it and make it theirs, right? I think that telling the story and seeing the experience and sharing the experience is a very important part of the journey and learning so that people have the whole solid you know foundation and have a better foundation of the knowledge plus sometimes it's definitely shown that we need somebody needs to hear the same thing several times and heard it repeated to actually have it sink in and learn it so those are some of the reasons another reason is because I'm 100% unscripted you know my I'm not a robot I don't read off cue cards I do have the questions printed out here I don't have the answers printed out here. Everything's off the top of my head and I'm trying to put it together on the fly for you guys. All my videos, none of my videos are scripted. They're all unscripted. I try to be as concise as possible, but sometimes it takes me a little of time to explain what I'm gonna say. But also I do this for teaching benefit because sometimes I repeat myself. And sometimes I give you a lot more of the backstory than you may just want because you just want the answer. But sometimes the backstory is actually more important than the answer in my opinion. Like, is the goal of life just to get to the end of your life to have all this money or something? Or, you know, when you go on a trip, is the destination going to Paris just the destination and getting to Paris is, is at the end of your trip? No. The fun of life, in my personal opinion, you guys might have a different opinion, is the journey. I want you guys to enjoy the journey. And there's so much more to the journey than just the answer. I just want the answer, John, give me the answer. I can give you the answer and it might go in one ear and come out the other and you're not going to do any. But if you have more of the backstory, more of the foundation, more of the reasoning why, then maybe you're more likely to do it. And of course, I like to think that's true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But that's why sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to get to the point, get to the answer. Because I wanted to give you guys a backstory. I want to give, give you the, like I asked, I answered the question about cyanide and apples. And why don't I tell you that it's better to juice the small apples and eat the skins and it's better to get the core of the apples. 
Because these are things that are all important. They can make a difference in your life if you guys implement them. And nowadays, people just want the answer. Do you eat cyanide in the seeds or not? There's more, than the, there's more to the answer than just the answer, right? So that's where I'm coming from. If you guys enjoy these videos, then hey, great. Stick around and watch more because that's the kind of person I am. It's rare that I do a really short videos because, you know, here's the thing. I've learned everything I've learned on my health journey over the last 25 years that I share with you guys. And to sum up 25 years, which is a lot of hours, a lot of seconds, a lot of minutes, and I don't know how many they are because I'm not the math whiz, is a lot. And to sum that up in a five minute video, I'm sorry, it just ain't happening. <laughs> you know, I summed up 20 years in about two hours when I made a video on the secrets to eating a raw foods diet. I'll post a link down below that video. That's an amazing video if you've never seen that. But it basically is a download of everything I've learned over like 20 years when I made the video that you could get in two hours, but then people complain, it's two hours! <laughs> I don't know, you can't please everybody, man. If you've already bailed, then you're not going to get to this part anyway. So I appreciate you guys for staying in this long and uh, learning from my knowledge that I have to share. I thank you guys for hanging out. And if you guys watch this video and you stay to the end, hey, please be sure to give this a thumbs up. That'll encourage me to do more Q&A videos in the future. Also, be sure to share this video with somebody else that you guys could think it could help. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as my new videos come out about every five to seven days. You don't know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are Wealth of Knowledge or 500 episodes at this time on this YouTube channel dedicated to teaching guys all about eating a nutrient-dense fruit and vegetable dominated diet and uh, you know, uncovering all the pitfalls so that you guys don't have to go through the pitfalls and you guys could be as successful as possible based on my experiences as well as the experiences from many people I meet along my journey that are a wealth of information. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.